goodness. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's just delightful to see you. So what I'm hoping to do this afternoon is to give a brief introduction to my latest book. The title is uh, Pen Theologies. It's a word I made up. Uh, the subtitle is Gods, Worlds, and Monsters. I got the idea for the project while I was writing about the stories that the natural sciences are currently telling us, beautiful stories of mythic proportions about infinite universes, fish that become land creatures, photons that make decisions, trees that communicate, rocks that are alive. All these stories are taking on for our secular world the role that sacred stories used to play. All of them tell us in different ways where we came from, how things get made, and how we ought to behave in relation to the world that we're a part of. Now, of course, these scientific stories say they have nothing to do with religion. Some of them, like the multiverse and some forms of evolution, even proclaim that they disprove the existence of God. But what's striking to me is that they're not really getting rid of God at all. They're just reassigning God's major tasks to the universe itself. They're attributing creation and sustenance and governance, destruction and redemption, all to forces inside the world rather than a force outside the world. So rather than kicking God out, one might say they're sort of pulling God all the way in. The philosophical name for this identity of God and world is pantheism. So I thought, this is great. I'll write a book about the unintentional pantheism of the natural sciences. I'll start with a quick conceptual history of pantheism, and then I'll demonstrate its reappearance in the natural and social sciences, despite the professed atheism of its authors. The problem was, the moment I went to gather the history of pantheism, I found there is no such history. Far from being a coherent school or even a concept, pantheism is really just an accusation. It's just a nasty thing to call an idea that a philosopher thinks is dangerous or dumb. So I ended up having to take a step back and figure out why pantheism is such a bad word in the Western tradition that made it up. I'm going to sketch a bit of that history here as a way to introduce the concerns of this book. In the first half of the talk, I'll explain what's so threatening about pantheism. And in the second half, I'll try to start reconstructing it as a concept to ask what pantheism might actually mean if we gave it a moment to speak before laughing it off the stage. Ultimately, and I'm thinking here of our friends at Extinction Rebellion, I think pantheism might be an interesting position to consider, just to consider, as we try to change our vision of the earth that we've been exploiting as an inert set of resources for human comfort. So here goes. Part one. In 1697, the French intellectual Pierre Bayle published his historical and critical dictionary, an eclectic set of rambling essays about biblical figures, monarchs, a couple of Asian empires, and the author's untrammeled loathing of the deceased philosopher Baruch Spinoza. Calling Spinoza a Jew by birth, and afterwards a deserter from Judaism, and lastly an atheist, Bale does not even take the time to explain the man's arguments. As far as he is concerned, even the quickest glance by the dullest of humans will reveal that Spinoza's philosophy surpasses all the monstrosities and chimerical disorders of the craziest people who were ever put away in lunatic asylums. What is this surpassing monstrosity, this chimerical lunacy? Bale only names it once, as if dwelling on it any longer might make it contagious. Hiding it in a footnote in a subordinate clause, Bale tells us that this insanity is the notion that mind and body are just attributes of the same substance, a single mental bodily everything that Spinoza called God or nature. So here's our monstrosity. According to Spinoza, God and nature are the same thing. The universe is what we mean when we say the word God. Unexpected? Perhaps. Unorthodox? Yes. Heretical, even. But why does Pierre Bale go out of his mind in the face of this idea? And why does he keep calling it monstrous? According to Michel Foucault, the word monster means mixture. Monsters are mixtures of different species, different sexes, different materials. Monsters mix things that ought to be opposed, like this fellow here, a manticore 
with the body of a lion and the head of a human. In other renditions, manticores also have the tail of a scorpion and the wings of a bat. The monster is a patching together of different parts. Now, as you've probably heard, Western philosophy, in its more sober forms, makes stark separations between mind and body, male and female, the rational and the irrational, light and darkness. Each of these is defined by not being its opposite. Moreover, these oppositions are unequal. The categories on the right are traditionally subordinated to the categories on the left. The stuff on the left is better, stronger, more real. And so the left side includes all the characteristics we tend to associate with God, while the right includes the characteristics we associate with world or creation or nature. God is anthropomorphic, right? has a kind of humanoid form, unchanging, perfect, and masculine, while the world is animal, vegetal, changing, imperfect, and feminine. We, still, we talk about Mother Earth, right? So when Spinoza tells us that God is the world, he's making a very big monster. By equating God with matter, Spinoza mixes the changing and the unchanging, created and creator, divinity and dirt, and as such, produces the most monstrous hypothesis that could be imagined, the most absurd, and the most diametrically opposed to the most evident notions of our mind. Now this guy, Bale, Pierre Bale, does tend to be a cantankerous writer, I should announce that, but his essay on Spinoza is honestly just a riot of unsubstantiated name calling. In addition to the repeated charges of monstrosity, Bale dubs Spinoza's teachings absurd, horrible, and vile. His ethics, an execrable abomination. His metaphysics, poppycock. And his theo-political treatise he calls a pernicious and detestable book. In a similar vein, one of Spinoza's contemporaries wrote that his books had been forged in hell by a renegade Jew and the devil. <laughs> and it, it's good, right? And the telltale sign of this forgery is the diabolical notion that God and nature are the same thing. This is the position a later anti-Spinozist will derisively name pantheism. Okay, so etymologically, pantheism means all God. Pan is all in Greek, theos, God. But it's not clear what all God means, in part because pantheism is a polemical rather than a positive term. A flood of people will say, you're a pantheist and that's absurd. But very few say, my doctrine is pantheist and this is what that means. So we kind of have to patch it together. Casually, the term pantheism tends to connote personal or communal reverence for nature. And it's no accident that Greek mythology gives the realm of nature to the goat god Pan. The word in Greek actually becomes the same thing, Pan and Pan. Um, Pan, a monstrous mixture of divinity, animality, and humanity. Literarily, pantheism often erupts in the form of the goat god himself. Pan is all over poetry. He tumbles into Renaissance, romantic, and Victorian poetry to play the pipes, lounge with shepherds, dance in caves, chase nymphs, and generally put the pan in pansexual. But philosophically, pantheism remains little more than a limit case, the position nearly everybody wants to avoid. But why? What's the matter with pantheism? To begin, it might help to address this question with its opposite. Namely, why is pantheism so attractive? Why does it keep arising such that it needs to be so constantly denounced? Might there be something alluring about this abominable position? A classic case of such ambivalence can be found in the work of the Reverend Nathaniel Smith Richardson, an Anglican theologian in a transcendentalist New England that's just starting to catch the fervor of spiritualism. The whole region is allegedly raving with pantheism, which Richardson calls a misguided, dangerous, anti-intellectual, and even appalling movement. At the same time, he says, he can see why pantheism has swept up the young and unchurched. There is a generosity about it, he admits, and a kindliness that's captivating. The kindly generosity of pantheism is its vision of God in all things. It's coloring the whole world divine as if it bore in its hand the wand of an enchanter. It's a gorgeous vision, he admits, with a bewitching power. 
Note the feminine and sexualized language here. Pantheism is enchanting, bewitching, and gorgeous. If you've got the stomach for it, you'll see this sexed up femininity coursing throughout the entire anti-pantheist genre. For example, the Reverend Morgan Dix of Manhattan warns that men lacking in sufficient education may have been tempted, seduced, tainted, poisoned by pantheism unawares. Similarly, Alexis de Tocqueville fears that pantheism ranks among those philosophies most likely to entice the human mind in democratic ages. Herman Melville's Ishmael confesses while meditating on what he calls the mysterious divine Pacific that lifted by these eternal swells, you needs must own the seductive God bowing your head to Pan. And Melville himself, in a dramatically homoerotic letter to Nathaniel Hawthorne, says that even though it is flummery, pantheism is, is, is monstrously attractive to Melville. So there's that word again. Pantheism is monstrous because it conflates opposite categories, God and world. And fittingly, it keeps provoking conflated emotional responses. The monstrous mixture of creature and creator gives rise to a monstrous mixture of attraction and repulsion, of loathing and longing, of I hate this thing, but I can't seem to think about anything else. Part two. In her feminist rereading of Plato's Cave, Luce Irigaray reminds us of Western philosophy's raging ambivalence toward women. Like the Freudian boy child, philosophy aims to make its way from the dark womb space of the earth to the father's brilliant ideas. From paganism to monotheism, earth goddess to daddy god, the many to the one, the cave to the sky. Women then are the abandoned origin of philosophy, and as such, they're a complex site of disgust and desire, repudiation and nostalgia, rejection and command. As Edward Said and generations of post-colonial scholars have demonstrated, a similarly violent ambivalence motivates Western representations of the so-called East. Orientalist literature both glorifies and vilifies a feminized and racialized other, at once seductive and repulsive. And this is the problem, I think, with pantheism. It seems to be a foreign, feminine, dark, colonized invasion into the supposedly rational structure of white European thought. So for example, making no effort to hide his Orientalist panic, Richardson's treatise begins by proclaiming pantheism is the child of the mysterious East. As evidence, Richardson imagines a nameless Indian sage in some dim and fragrant grove or silent mountain cavern, dreaming up the absurd idea that even dark and earth-born masses are suffused with the divine expression of the one animating spirit. Thanks to its radical egalitarianism, Richardson admits, pantheism is a captivating philosophy. The problem is that it threatens to keep captivating, advancing its appalling movement, there's the ambivalence, to such an extent that he says, pantheism in Europe and the West is destined to become the correlative of Buddhism in the East. <laughs> Goddess forbid. Such pantheist seduction, Richardson insists, can only be counteracted by Christian orthodoxy. Above all things, he says, let there be a plain, distinct, and dogmatic teaching of the incarnation of the eternal word, and the caps are all in the original manuscript. <laughs> this is a reference, of course, to the appearance of God in human form in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. But when Richardson says we need to proclaim that God came into the world as one man, he's saying God is not the whole animal, vegetable, mineral world. Just that one guy, right? In occupied Palestine, zero-ish CE. What panics Richardson about the advance of pantheism is not, however, the simple demise of Christendom. Rather, what he fears above all is a kind of collective, racialized unmanning, the conversion, in his words, of rosy Western men into dusty, earthbound, womanly pseudo-Buddhists. He is terrified, in short, by blurred distinctions and cross boundaries of East and West, passivity and activity, femininity and masculinity, earth and God, darkness and light. 
So at this point, I'd like to shift from the diagnostic to the prescriptive. If pantheism is reviled because it threatens the very structure of Western philosophy, religion, and political order, then might it be useful to those of us who seek to destructure such orders? Here again are some of the foundational hierarchies of Greek, Roman, French, German, and English metaphysics. Now, if you're the product of any remotely feminist or post-colonial, decolonial, materialist, queer, ecological, or critical race theory, you are bored to death looking at this slide. <laughs> but as British philosopher of religion Grace Jansen began to argue in the late 1990s, the reason this structure still won't budge is that we haven't yet managed to destroy its root, which again is to say the opposition between God and world. In rejecting this most basic distinction, pantheism rejects the hierarchies it undergirds. So in this sense, one could argue that pantheism is more radical than atheism because it changes the meaning of the word God. Rather than a singular, anthropomorphic, masculine, all-powerful, immaterial force who either does or doesn't exist, pantheism would suggest that God means multiplicity, cosmomorphism, right, rather than anthropomorphism, multiple genders, relational power, and a promiscuous embodiment in all things. Therefore, Jansen concludes, if philosophy wants to be feminist, it's going to have to be pantheist. The argument is straightforward. It's fairly well known. Lots of people read Jansen. And yet, I cannot think of a single scholar who has taken up this call. Rather, pantheism in Western thought continues to be denigrated by philosophers and theologians of nearly every school and political persuasion, from the orthodox to the heretical, liberals to liberationists, eco-feminists to Christo-capitalists. Whatever it is we say we are, we are not by any means pantheists. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.